You're listening to the micro version of the Savage Love Cast at savage.love. If you're stuck in a relationship quandary, or if you're looking for sexual harmony, well, there's nothing you can't ask on the Savage Love Cast. The people Donald Trump endorsed in 2022. The freaks and geeks and ass-licking insurrectionists he endorsed wound up costing Republicans control of that chamber of Congress. Donald Trump prevented Mitch McConnell from retiring as Senate Majority Leader. I sent a sympathy card to Mitch, who could have voted to convict Trump during his second impeachment trial and spared us the bloodbath Trump is threatening if he doesn't win and or can't steal the 2024 election. But my sympathy card, like Mitch McConnell's spine, and Mitch McConnell's soul seems to have gotten lost in the mail. Anyway, Trump is doing it again. He's out there endorsing freaks and geeks and ass-looking insurrectionists. And one of his endorsees, one of the very fine people, one of the best people, one of the people ready, willing, and able to spend the next four years on their knees eating the corn out of Donald Trump's shit, got embroiled in a sex scandal this week. You know how I love me my sex scandals. I want to talk about this one, but I don't want to oversell it because as sex scandals go, it's pretty thin. There's a there there, but not much there there. No pics, no videos, no Russian hookers, no golden showers, no lifted luggage. All we've got is a hunger, an alleged hunger, for cock. Businessman Bernie Moreno is one of the Republicans running for the GOP nomination for Senate in Ohio. It's the most competitive GOP Senate primary in the country. Sherrod Brown is the Democratic incumbent in the race. And Ohio has gone very red and very MAGA since it first sent Brown to the Senate. Let's just say it. Ohio has lost its fucking mind. And whoever wins the GOP primary in Ohio has a good chance of taking Brown out, which could wind up handing control of the Senate to the GOP, which would not be ideal. Moreno, interestingly, is an immigrant originally from Colombia, came here when he was 18 years old, and for a long time when he was a businessman in Ohio, he was a vocal supporter of LGBT rights. And then he got into politics, at which point the advocate says he began walking back his previous support for anti-discrimination laws protecting queer people and gay marriage and queer representation on TV. I wish I could report that this guy, this immigrant, who is supporting the man who this week described immigrants as animals and not people at a rally, got caught with a dick in his mouth or a rent boy in his cabana or his caboose. And we know Moreno heard what Trump said about immigrants because Trump said it at a rally in Ohio for Bernie Moreno, who he had just endorsed. He said this shit about immigrants in front of Moreno, an immigrant. Anyway, the AP reported this week that in 2008, Moreno, straight, married, conservative, Christian, MAGA, Moreno, or someone with access to his verified email account, placed an ad on Adult Friend Finder seeking dick. Hi, looking for young guys to have fun with while traveling, the ad began. Eh, I don't know. Seems a little groomery to me. Rumors about Moreno's personal ads seeking young dick were circulating in Ohio. They were being circulated by his rivals in the race, other Republicans. And his campaign this week, when the AP finally reported on the story, confirmed the existence of the ad and that it had indeed been created using his private email account, but claimed it was a prank by a junior staffer. Who amongst us has not given a junior staffer access to our private email accounts? Anyway, the campaign also declined to make this junior staffer available to the press. And no one, and I mean no one, is buying this. But you know what I buy, and I've long bought, and I've encouraged other people to buy? I think a straight dude can be curious about gay sex and maybe experiment with it, suck a dick or two, hopefully an age-appropriate dick or two, and still be straight. Basically, I've always wanted to live in a world where straight guys had the same latitude straight women do. If you're a woman, you can have a few same-sex experiences, a little lesbian sex, even a lesbian relationship, and still identify as straight when you grow up or heteroflexible, and everyone believes you. I want to live in a world where straight guys have the same latitude gay guys do. I had sex with women. Not so much an experiment for me, more like sex with women under duress, the closet. 
But no one tells me when I admit to having had sex with women that I can't be gay because I slept with a few girls many, many years ago. I think straight guys have always felt that straight guys would be better straight guys, less crazy, less paranoid, less violently homophobic if they were as free to experiment, suck a dick once or twice, or get their dick sucked once or twice by a man, and still be believed when they said they were straight, just like we believe all those straight women who've had some fun with other women once or twice and still identify as straight, because they are straight. But if you're a politician who has moved to the right on queer issues over the years, cravenly, to appeal to the GOP base and earn the endorsement of an authoritarian wannabe dictator who is threatening mass deportations of people like you, immigrants like you, because you're that hungry for power, you don't get to live in the world I want to live in. If you had a dick in your mouth even once, if you had an ad up on Grinder or Adult Friend Finder or Sniffies or Recon or Scruff looking for dick to put in your mouth and someone finds it, yeah, you have to live in your world and in your world, in your party, sucking a dick even once or just admitting to wanting to suck a dick even once means you ain't straight. It also means you may not get the GOP nomination no matter how hard you suck Donald Trump's dick. All right, coming up on today's show, on the Micro Savage Lovecast, tons of your Qs, lots of my As, and on the Magnum, but also the Micro, Rob Wilde, the UK's number one bulge boy, adult entertainer, MC, and himbo geek, joins me to kick off a new segment we're calling, What Are You Doing?, we wanted to share our interview with Rob, who's as charming and delightful as his bulge is enormous with all of our listeners. Also a way of tempting you micro listeners to become Magnum subs. Something else that might tempt you to become a Magnum sub this week. We have another Savage Love live this Thursday, March 21st, noon Pacific. I will be answering questions on Zoom. Get them to me early by going to savage.love slash ask Dan. We will send the link out to that Zoom chat on the morning of the show to all of our Magnum subs. And if you want to get that link, become a Magnum sub now at savage.love. All right, let's get to this week's show. This episode of The Lovecast is brought to you by the good folks at Squarespace. They make it easy to build a beautiful website, blog, or online store. Head on over to squarespace.com savage for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use the offer code SAVAGE to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. This episode is brought to you by Helix Sleep, the best mattress for your individualized comfort. Right now, my listeners get up to $200 off all mattress orders at helixsleep.com slash savage. This episode is brought to you by the Meridian Trimmer, the very best tool for trimming your body hair. Go to meridiangrooming.com and use the code SAVAGE for an exclusive 15% off. Hi, Dan. I am a 38-year-old Cis woman, late to lesbian, with my girlfriend for a year and a half. We have a wonderful relationship. She's the first woman that I've ever been with. I have a question about our sex life, which is amazing. We both say it's amazing. We both say it's the best we've ever had. But my question is that when she goes down on me or she touches me, I come really fast. She turns me on so much. We always have a lot of foreplay, a lot of kissing, a lot of build up, and that's all great. But when I go down on her or I'm touching her, it takes her a really long time, which is fine. It's completely fine that I understand that it takes some women a really long time to come from oral. That's not a problem. Although sometimes I do actually feel a little bit insecure that maybe my technique just isn't as good as hers. But it's mostly that it's starting to cause her a little bit of anxiety and a little bit of sort of that like lying there sort of going, am I going to come, am I going to come? Even though I've told her it doesn't matter and I'm just happy to be down there and there's no goal for her to have an orgasm. But of course, there kind of always is that goal, isn't there? Even if you say there isn't the goal to have an orgasm, it's what everyone's hoping for. She... Must have different anatomy to me because she can use a vibrator for like 10 minutes and not come and I would be finished in a minute. But she does come really fast when she's taking more of an active role rather than a passive role. So if we're both eating each other's pussy at the same time or she's fucking me with a strap on or she's grinding against me, she'll come really quickly. So obviously we can just 
do those sorts of things. But I don't want to get stuck into a rut where it's like we just always go straight to a 69 because we know we're going to get off really fast. Sometimes we do that if we're really tired. But one of the things I love about our sex life is the variety. So I guess my question is how can she just be not stressing and having a good time and enjoying herself without worrying about this? And do you have any suggestions as to what we can do just to keep things really good and get her off as much as possible? When it comes to orgasms, pressure is bad. Also bad, also bad, like pressure, is indifference. You don't want to feel from your partner that it doesn't matter to them whether or not you come. It is a fine line that we walk. We should communicate to our partners that we are invested in their pleasure, that it would please us to see them come. But of course, if if they're not feeling it, no pressure and no hard feelings, and I'm not going to be sad or hurt if if, if you don't come, and I'm not going to interpret that as a statement about my attractiveness or desirability or skill. But you also don't want to be communicating to your partner that you don't give a shit whether they come or not. That said, I think it's a little weird that you're concerned about, all, you know, you get, listen to your call, listen to your whole call, and at the end you start just tossing off the things that actually work, the reliable things. 69ing, she comes and comes fast, fucking you with a strap on dildo that's obviously hitting her in her larger sex organ, the one between her ears, or hitting her in her clit and her crotch in such a way, or both that she can come really quickly and effortlessly, uh, grinding against you to give you pleasure, gives her pleasure. There is something about her doing things with you that also provide her with stimulation that get her out of her head, that make it possible for her to be maybe a little less self-conscious in the approach to orgasm, and they work. And so you should do those things. You should do those things that you know work. And you should identify more things that will work for the same reason that the three things that you cite work. That your partner, when she is focused on and providing you with pleasure, but a kind of pleasure that is also providing her with the right kind of stimulation, her orgasms are not elusive at those times. Doesn't mean you only ever have to do it that way. You can have long sessions with a vibrator where it's just you between her legs and all about her pussy and you are in it to win it. No pressure to come, but not indifferent to her coming. And just let those be longer sessions or let that be foreplay and at some point pivot to grinding or pivot to 69ing or pivot to her fucking the shit out of you with that strap on dildo that always gets her off. Do what works. And yeah, maybe your partner looks at how quickly you can come with the vibrator, how quickly you can come when it's just her going down on you and not you going down on each other. And she wishes that her body worked the exact same way your body worked and she could climax easily from the kinds of sex acts or pleasure or stimulation that you can climax easily from. But no two bodies work the same way. And she has to, and I think you, know, you guys have been together a long time, you've been married a long time, and having sex for a long time. At some point you have to accept that your body works the way it works and her body works the way her body works and you're going to work together <laughs> on what works for both of you and not privilege or prioritize or valorize what one person is able to do or able to enjoy or is more responsive to and then regard the other person as somehow deficient or broken or having to get to that place too so that you're on absolutely equal footing, which you never will be on because you have different bodies and they work in different ways. You have different response cycles, different plateaus on the approach to orgasm. So yeah, there's, there's no problem here. This is not a problem. There's a lot of things that you could guys do together that work, that get you off, that get her off, and your sex life is going to be a combo platter of those things. The things that work for you that get you off reliably, the things that work for her that get her off reliably. That's what you should be incorporating into your sex life. You shouldn't be trying to make the things that work for you reliably work for her reliably too because that's just pressure and an unreasonable expectation because again, two different bodies, two different people, two different ways your orgasms and bodies and pussies work. This episode is brought to you by Squarespace and I am here to tell you 
They offer so much more than just a website platform. They actually help you to build and grow your business or creative project. If you're just getting started, you can load in one of their professional website templates with designs for every category and use case, then customize your look, update content, and add features to fit your unique needs. You can make any Squarespace template do what you want so your idea, brand, or business stands out online on every device. You can easily sell custom merch and create a passive income stream that engages your audience and scales your brand. Design your products, and then production, inventory, and shipping are handled for you, saving you time and money. Then sell your products on an online store. Whether you sell physical, digital, or service products, Squarespace has the tools you need to start selling online. You can use their asset library. Upload, organize, and access all your content from one place. With the new asset library, you're able to manage all your files from one central hub and use them across the Squarespace platform. And I could go on and on. Don't walk, run to squarespace.com slash savage for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use the offer code savage to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. That's squarespace.com slash savage and use the offer code savage. Hi, Dan. I always love your advice. But for this question, I was wondering if you could invite an attractive young woman on to your show to help dissect this topic. Us guys could probably learn a thing or two from the minds of of a young woman or young women. Anyways, after many years of online dating, I've come to some conclusions about how modern dating is fundamentally broken. Here's the problem with modern dating. Math and superficial preferences. Math is the problem. The numbers and ratios simply don't add up. Breaks down like this. You have legions of men in any given city. Men are often superficial and tend to pursue women based on appearance. This means for the sake of simplicity that the majority of men on dating apps are pursuing the most attractive women. One attractive woman, for example, could have hundreds or possibly even thousands of men interested in her depending on the size of the city and population. I briefly had a fling with someone once who said she had a thousand matches on Tinder, for example. And you also see the number of followers a woman has on apps like Instagram and FetLife. You can imagine how many messages and comments they must receive. The amount of followers a single woman can have is is staggering. Right away, you have eliminated the possibility for hundreds or thousands of men to meet these attractive women because it's just simply an overwhelming ratio mismatch. There's no possible way a woman could have the time or interest in this large volume of men. Now let's say she matches with 100 men on a dating app. She may message or genuinely engage or show interest in perhaps 20 of these guys. Let's say these 20 guys are great men, attractive and intelligent men. She will soon likely and reasonably become overwhelmed trying to keep up with 20 app or text conversations. She will then be forced in these circumstances to whittle it down to perhaps two or three men. You can see where this is going. In the end, she'll date one of them. That's what most people want, right? Just one person to focus on. So that leaves, let's say, 19 out of 20 great guys initially from a pool of 100 or more. So these like 19 or 20 good men that she had to reject out of sheer volume. So that leaves 19 theoretically good men who are lonely and single. And then the exhausting pursuit for the next one begins and the cycle starts all over again. So I don't know, Dan, what do we do about this? It's not a woman's fault that a society functions this way. Of course not. Uh, you know, don't hate the player, hate the game, as they say. Is this just evolutionary biology now fused with modern technology? Do we not need to get real about modern dating and come to grips with this current status quo? The odds are not in your favor. Men, women, straight men, straight women. On dating apps, women get something like a 100 to a thousand times more responses than the average man gets. And it can become for women overwhelming, a full-time job to sift through and pick through responses, messages, texts from men to find the guys that they might be interested in. Yeah, that is a needle in a haystack thing. And for men, that can be really frustrating. How do you stand out? The The sense of competition 
and the odds being so not in your favor. What do you do? Well, you could get on Bumble. It's a dating app where the woman has to make the first move. So all of the guys that she's talking to on Bumble are guys that she wanted to talk to. So guys, you just have to Sadie Hawkins dance it. You have to hang back and wait to be approached. And some guys find that frustrating, especially in a culture where men are socialized to make the first move, that that's the expectation. Bumble kind of turns that all on its head. But it means you aren't sending hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of messages to women who are so overwhelmed by the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of messages that they're getting that they never see yours or get around to responding to yours. Other people have made this observation, all the observations going through the depressing math that you've gone through. What can you do about it? Not a lot, except not rely exclusively on dating apps. I think it is important to be on the apps. That is where people tend to meet now. Plurality of opposite sex relationships now get their start online. The overwhelming majority of same sex relationships get their start online. We are approaching the singularity where most relationships, opposite sex or same sex, will have started online, on hookup apps, on these little singles bars we carry around in our pockets. But it is important, in addition to the frustrating game that being online and being on the dating apps is and the amount of time it wastes and sucks up potentially, it is important to balance that out with another approach, which I like to call leaving the fucking house, going places, doing things, moving through the world without your phone in your face, volunteering, getting onto sports leagues, going out, doing things, snowboarding, just moving through the world. You may have chance encounters with other human beings. Some of these human beings might be human beings you want to fuck. Some of these human beings might be human beings who want to fuck you. And you up your odds of those kinds of chance encounters. That whole other avenue toward sexual success, perhaps temporary sexual success, a sexually successful moment or experience, or mating success. Because you may meet somebody that you wind up dating and partnered with in an LTR. And while a majority of people are meeting on the apps, not everybody. So you got to move on both fronts. You got to be online, have your best game, current and accurate pictures, have your friends look at your pictures and tell you whether they think that they capture you and are accurate and representative. And also leave the fucking house. And you know what? When you leave the fucking house, as men and women, it's rough parody out there. Online, a thousand messages from men in every woman's inbox. In the world, at the book club, at the bar, on the slopes, wherever it is that you're moving through the world, enjoying your life and encountering other people who are moving through the world, enjoying their lives, it's going to be parody, roughly, 50-50, male-female. And the odds will be a little bit more in your favor. We talk a lot here about spicing up our sex lives, trying new things like trying it in the car or trying it in public. But sometimes a comfortable and familiar place is the best place to try it, the best place to do it, a place where you can fall asleep right afterwards. For me, that place is on top of my Helix mattress. We have one in our main bedroom, one in our other main bedroom, and one in our guest room who are our very special guest stars. The Helix lineup offers 20 unique mattresses, including the award-winning Lux Collection. That's ours. That's the mattress we have. The newly released Helix Elite Collection, a mattress designed for big and tall sleepers, and even mattresses made just for kids. To figure out which mattress is right for you, take the Helix Sleep Quiz to find your perfect mattress in under two minutes. And then your personalized mattress will be shipped straight to your door free of charge. But you will get, with your mattress, a 100-night sleep trial. You can try out your new mattress, see how your body adjusts. And if you decide it's not the best fit, you are welcome to return it for a full refund. Helix offers models with memory foam layers to provide optimal pressure relief if you sleep on your side, like me, or models with more responsive foam to cradle your body for essential support in stomach and back sleeping positions. Plus, enhanced cooling features to keep you from overheating at night. Helix mattresses all come with a 10 or 15 year warranty depending on the model. Helix has been awarded the number one mattress pick by GQ and Wired magazines. It's even recommended by multiple leading chiropractors and doctors of sleep medicine as a go-to fix for improving your sleep. 
And right now, for my listeners, Helix is offering 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows. Go to helixsleep.com slash savage to get 20% off and those two free pillows. With Helix, better sleep starts now. Hey, everybody. We're rolling out a new segment on this week's show, a segment we're calling What Are You Doing? There are a lot of sexy people out there doing a lot of sexy things, but not all of them have questions for me, and so they don't call into the show So I'm calling them instead because I want to ask, what are you doing? Joining us for our first, what are you doing? Rob Wild. Rob, welcome to the show. Hello. How are you doing? Great. So before we get to what are you doing, Rob, who are you? My name is Rob Wild. I am an adult entertainer, sex worker, and MC uh, from the United Kingdom, born and bred in London, but currently living in Manchester. All right, Rob. What are you doing? My kink in question being interrogated today is saline infusions, which is taking saline, which is a medical uh, liquid of, of salt and water, and injecting it into my genitalia to make giant cock and balls for people to enjoy. So a saline infusion enthusiast, I stumbled over your work on the internet. I saw what you were doing with your balls. It's very impressive. We had a case here in Seattle where someone was injecting silicone into their genitals and died. Saline. Yeah, I know. Not to be confused with silicone. What you're doing, the saline infusion that blows your testicles up to the size of a basketball, not dangerous. Not dangerous. No dangerous in any other um like medical medical procedure, both done by a professional or um, done by yourself. Saline is not permanent. After the initial growth, it is absorbed into the body. It's saline is essentially just salt water. It's great for hangovers as well, I find, because it keeps you hydrated throughout the night. But why are you doing this? What's the turn on? Or you say that to people like that doesn't turn me on. Why does that turn you on? I think that's the dumbest question in the sex space of all because turn on to yeah. subjective and personal, but can you describe what it is about this process and this body modification temporary that turns you on? I think, uh, I always think to those Tom and Finland, um, p- pictures of these kind of hypermasculine bodies and the inhumanly uh, large genitalia that's, ironically, are sometimes too big to even use, depends how much you do inflate by. I mean, sometimes I infuse to a, I would say, a realistic, beyond what you'd say is a, a average-sized uh, jet ball sack, but still pretty big. And then other times I just want to go massive to the point where it no longer becomes even usable. And I think I feel I love that paradoxical nature. I love that it's the height of masculinity. It's the biggest cock and balls you've ever seen. But it's almost like chastity because you can't use it. It's almost demasculizing at the same time. So it is a different way to lock up a dick. You're essentially locked up a cock without a cage. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I'm sure anyone who goes across my um, Twitter will see me wearing a nice like, latex cow outfit. Tasteful, tasteful cow print. Stunning. Because it almost looks like like others, in a oh my way. God. Uh, I was going to say that, and I was worried it might offend you. There are images that you've shared very generously with the world of <laughs> you and some of your play partners on all fours with your balls <laughs> swollen to enormous proportions with the saline infusion and it looks like Mm udders you look like cows that's utterly ridiculous i will not stand for this kind (laughs) of event i think my philosophy with like any kink is like if at the end of the day it is ridiculous like if you can't if you can't laugh at it it's hot don't get me wrong For, for me personally and for a lot of people it's hot it's i feel it's one of those kinks where you can enjoy it as an admirer just as much as you can as a person who does it yourself. I've got plenty of people who want to play with me in when I'm in that state and often a bit curious about trying it themselves. But when I explain to them the process, they kind of maybe lose interest due to the uh, needle in the ball sack element to it. I, I was going to say, explain the process, please. When people ask, is it painful? I say it's as painful as stabbing yourself in the balls of a needle, which is not the... <laughs> It's not directly into the balls, it, into the skin. It's really about confidence. I imagine it's like you, if you waver and are nervous about doing it, it's going to hurt a lot more. But if you just go pop it in and then let the saline 
uh, flow in with an IV drip is quite simple. And uh, if you do it right and follow you know, basic hygienic standards, there's no risks at all. So do you remember your first time? I do. I'm up with a guy down in down south of the UK who had moved on, who'd moved on to silicone quite a lot. He used to do saline, he had all this stuff. I was interested in meeting him and he showed me how to do it. And he was quite adamant of, I won't touch you. I'm going to tell you what to do, but I will let you do everything yourself, both to protect myself in case, you know, something God forbid goes wrong and be so that in future you can do it by yourself, which I was very um, grateful for. And uh, yeah, he's, he's my mentor. Do you remember the first time you saw this? Were you like, oh, it clicked with you? You were like, what is this person doing? How did they get their balls so big? How do I get my balls so big? And the saline infusion part was the means to that end of the large exaggerated genitalia. Or what, when you saw it, were you just like, like, what was that first exposure? How did this kink take root? I don't know. I, 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 I imagine I must have seen silicone first. I, I, I feel like they, those kind of pictures, um, I would have seen them first and like, being like, oh, that looks very nice. But I, f- I feel like I was like, I like the look of it, but I'd never get done myself. And then finding out that, oh, I can do it. And then it's after a few days, it's all finished. Oh, like, brilliant. Yeah. And luckily enough, there was someone who lived, my, my mentor, as I called him, just a short train ride away. I know for a lot of guys, message message me who want to try it out. They're not so lucky. Like some of them live in the States where it's these couple of hours, you know, drive or flight away to find someone who's also into it and can show them how to do it properly. It's not one of those kinks you want to just look on the internet and f- sit at home by yourself and just try and follow along by yourself. You really want someone there who knows what they're doing. There are lots of kinks where you need a mentor. Fisting, sounding, saline infusions. And again, I want to emphasize, you talked about the person that you first did this with doing silicone injections. Silicone injections are very dangerous. People die. Yeah. And so if yes. you want to blow your genitals up in this particular way, get this particular look, do it with saline. It's temporary. It's safe. You're not going to fucking die. Amen to that. So I'm curious, and I'm sure some of my listeners are curious right now, about the particular sensation. You put you mm. saline into the ball sack. Does it hurt? Does it put pressure on the testicles? When your balls are so big, you're kind of temporarily physically disabled by the size of them is it painful is that part of it is it one of those kinks where a little bit of discomfort is a part of the turn on or is it not this is not uncomfortable at all your ball's just like floating your sack's an aquarium for a moment and it doesn't really hurt or does it hurt the actual infusion obviously i say it's a needle into the skin which is if you've had injections it's no it's no more painful than that and then you're filling up with essentially like salt so there's a little bit that can be a little bit of a sting and sometimes it hurts like a son of a bitch it, it really does it, i remember um, and so, some days some days it's absolutely smooth sailing no no discomfort whatsoever and the last time i infused it felt like i was having a baby i was there holding my friend pan we're infusing at the same time and I'm, he's like going push through it push through it i'm like you oh did my this god to me. <laughs> i can see the head why did it hurt? Did, did the salt burning your balls? Like, or was it just the pressure? What was it about that time that made it hurt as opposed to some other times when it didn't hurt? Sometimes it can be the temperature of the saline. So you want to, before you infuse, you want to uh, warm it up to its like body temperature. A, that helps with uh, keeping the, the skin of the, uh, the balls kind of like loose and nice and stretchy. And because obviously your body's going to re- react negatively to cold coming into that nice warm environment. So uh, I, I, don't, I don't think I'd sufficiently warmed up the saline to a degree that was... Uh... <laughs> but I pushed through and um, the sensation, once it's all um, like everything's removed and sealed up, it is lovely. Anyone who's familiar with ball stretching or ball weights will um, attest that it's a ni- like it's something very nice about the pole. I guess you'd call it the tug. Your cream master muckles working overtime to hold your balls up that are suddenly much, much heavier. It really is a a, a nice feeling experience. And I suppose like as much as a physical kink as it is a mental one, because you're walking around, you like go down to the, you go down to the shops, 
depending on how big your bulge is, and you're just like walking along, knocking stuff off the uh, off the shelves. <laughs> how long does it take if you've blown your balls up to a large extent? How long does it take for them to revert to their normal state? I always say it's got like a half life of a day, so you go down by half the size over a day. Also depends on a lot of things. If you, depending on how hydrated you are, if you keep yourself nice and hydrated, it lasts longer. If you wear a, a cock ring on the balls, that'll keep it all in. It takes, I'd say, about two days for it to go, or everything to go back to normal. And frankly, good riddance, because after a while, once once the uh, the high of it's gone over, you're, you're laying in bed and then you roll over like, oh, giant basketball between my legs. Oh, <laughs> in the way. <laughs> I have to admit that... I'm a little curious about what that might feel mm-hmm. like. So if you know somebody within a couple of hours of Seattle who's good at it, maybe I would, as a philosopher, give this a try. I don't think it's my kink. I don't think it would become my kink. But I am morbidly curious about what that would feel like. If anyone wants to try it and do it themselves, I would say is, A, do not do it by yourself. At least try and find someone who's with a little bit of experience. And B, if the idea of putting a needle into yourself is too much. This is not the kink for you, unfortunately. Where can people who want to see what you've been doing find you on the internet? I'm glad you asked. You can find me on, what do we call it now? Tw- Twitter? I'm allowed to call it Twitter. Twitter. I'm, not t- I'm not calling it X. We never call it X. Twitter. <laughs> or the bad place. Oh, yeah. So you can find me in the bad place. It's Rob Wild on OnlyFans. You can also find me on Instagram at Emil Nitrate, which is my drag persona. But uh, let's, <laughs> I'm not going to put that. Maybe my drag name should be Celine Dion. Oh my God, that's genius. That's genius. Have a big old bulge of an iceberg tattooed on the front of the uh, Speedo. That'd be great. I, I missed a trick there. So sorry. <laughs> Rob Wild, you can find him online. You can find his balls in various states of enormity also online. Thank you so much for jumping on with me today and uh, keep doing what you're doing. Sounds like fun. I will. Thank you very much for having me. This episode is brought to you by the Meridian Trimmer, my new favorite tool for shaving down there. Meridian offers powerful trimmers that cut through even the coarsest hair, but their trimmers are gentle enough for your privates. You'll enjoy a comfortable shave below the belt with no nicks, cuts, or ingrowns. Meridian trimmers are for men, they're for women, they're for non-binary folks, and they're for any style, whether you prefer completely bare, neatly trimmed scruff, or a well-rounded bush. This high-quality waterproof trimmer is fitted with a 6,000 RPM motor, safe ceramic blades, and an anti-nick shaving guard. And Meridian has so many happy customers, over 1,000 five-star reviews online. With the Meridian trimmer, you can get your body hair looking just how you like it and feel good and sexy with your fuzz. Get a Meridian trimmer today for the ultimate trimming experience without the pain, discomfort, or awkwardness. Order now and take control of your grooming routine on your own terms. Listeners of the Savage Lovecast get an extra 15% off your order using the coupon code SAVAGE. Go to M-E-R-I-D-I-A-N grooming.com and use the code SAVAGE for an exclusive 15% off. You deserve a better and safer below-the-belt trimming experience. And with Meridian Trimmer, you can get one today. Hi, Dan. I'm a 34-year-old queer, mostly cis woman from the Northeast. Uh, And my partner is a queer, transgender woman. But we're currently on a break. And I'm trying to decide if this is a partnership that I want to be long-term moving forward. What's going on first We definitely have some differences spiritually, as well as some parenting differences. She has a nine-year-old. I have a three- and a five-year-old. Although we have a pretty great sex life, there's some stuff there as well. She has had bottom surgery, and she didn't exactly get a long time to kind of take her new equipment out for a run. So she has a desire to be penetrated by someone with the correct anatomy to penetrate um, instead of just a toy. And obviously, um, I cannot do that. (laughs) And I've always been pretty open to her exploring this um, elsewhere. But on top of that, I also, although I came out as bisexual as a teenager, have had uh, very little opportunity to date 
uh, women in my adult life besides her. So we both have some exploration to do, but we're having some fundamental problems in our relationship too. At the same time, I am deeply in love with her. I'm very attracted to her. We have a lot in common as well. And in some ways, I think we could parent well together as well. But at this point, I'm trying to figure out, do we break up? Because there are so many hurts and resentments already in the relationship. Do we move forward and make a deeper commitment to each other? Do we open up our relationship and try non-monogamy? I wish I had some idea what the conflicts and resentments and hurts were about. You say that you have differences spiritually, some parenting differences, you sometimes struggle around communication. Then you say you have a great sex life, but the only real point of contention that you introduce seems to be a conflict about sex. Your girlfriend has a particular sexual need, which is to be dicked down, that you can't meet with a toy. She wants to have sex with somebody who has an actual physical, biological penis, and you can't provide that for her. And I'm just reading into that. I mean, that's all I have to sort of hang my sex advice hat on is that's the point of conflict. Because later in your call, you say, what do we do? Do we break up? And you're already on a break. So breaking up would just be extending indefinitely the break that you're already on. Or do you move forward and make a deeper commitment, dot, 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 or open the relationship up and try non-monogamy. And the framing of that, how you roll that out, gives me the impression that you would regard a deeper commitment moving forward as a monogamous commitment, which you've already been told by your girlfriend, isn't ideal for her because there are sexual experiences that she wants to have and wants to be a part of her awesome sex life that you can't provide her with. Or do you open up and try non-monogamy, which I guess would be to not commit? You frame this as there's commitment and monogamy, and then there's opening up and trying non-monogamy, which is the opposite of, I guess, commitment. And if that's the conflict, you two have to get on the same page about that. A committed relationship can be a monogamous one. A committed relationship can be a non-monogamous one. But what does commitment mean to you? And if what commitment means to you is sexual exclusivity, which is my hunch based on how you kind of framed your choices there at the end, maybe you should stay on this break because you're not going to get the commitment that you want or need from her, at least now. And if what this break is about is, you know, go out there, sow your wild oats or get those wild oats sowed into you, and then we can circle back and see if... Once your curiosity is satisfied about sex with biological men, if you could commit to being in a same-sex relationship or same-gender relationship that's sexually exclusive with me, if that is indeed what you want. But if what you want is her, and what she's telling you is that she can be with you, and you're attracted to her, and there's love there, and you have a shared sense of humor and you have great conversations and you think you could get on the same page about parenting, although there's been some conflict. You have the makings of what could be a great relationship, but not necessarily a sexually exclusive one. And if you can let that go, if you can wrap your head around the possibility that a relationship can be committed and loving and stable and open, maybe you could have a relationship with this woman a loving, committed relationship with this woman that's not sexually exclusive. And if, as I'm just guessing here, that's been the conflict, you could do away with that conflict. You could re resolve that conflict if you could get there, if you could get to being in an open relationship with this woman. But if this woman does not want to be in a closed relationship and couldn't be happy in a closed relationship, and you can't be happy in an open relationship, well, then you're just fundamentally sexually incompatible and it won't work. Hi, Dan. Late 40s cis woman here, uh, living in Australia, but originally by way of England. I'm having surgery to remove excess skin and fat after a hard one 90 kilo weight loss. One of the services that I could ask my clinic for is to render my excess fat 
which sounds disgusting, but we've all seen Fight Club. My boyfriend is really keen to masturbate with the silky smooth lotion that we could produce from this. Is there a name for this kink? This is one of those questions that come in semi-regularly and that I've answered a few times. And then I think, well, I don't need to answer this question again. I've answered this question. And then I realize it's been, I don't know, five, six years since I last answered this exact question. And in that time, some people have just come to the show. Some people aren't familiar with this really common junior varsity kink called rendering. You're rendering your fat and using it as lube. There are rend fetishists out there, renderers. And that's what apparently the clinic that you are going to for the surgery is willing to help facilitate the expression of that particular kink. All right, do it. Rend it. There's even a hookup app for people into this. Render, R-E-N-D-R. Check it out. All right, before we get to this week's listener response calls, I want to share a couple of listener comments about last week's show posted on the very lively comment threads at savage.love. Almost everyone thought I was too hard on the gay dad whose daughter called in about dad and mom meeting for the first time since dad came out and got a boyfriend at her wedding. Says David B., Dan, I am shocked by how angry you were at the gay dad in this episode. You've made too many assumptions on this man's mindset at the time he married. I came out as gay in my 40s. The world I lived in didn't allow me to explore that side of me until shortly before that. Please remember, Dan, we all live in different worlds. Says Ricard, shocked at Dan's angry reaction to gay dad. The sentiment is correct, but the personal venom out of line. It was easy for the precocious 15-year-old Dan who figured all that out even before finishing puberty, but many of us failed to figure out our sexuality for a very long time. My answer for the caller would have been, to the woman getting married, don't let your wedding day be the first time your mom and dad have seen each other in years. They need to meet and work some of this out. Dad needs to make some of the apologies he owes mom. Mom needs to suck it up and process some of this in time for the wedding. Both parents need to prioritize their daughter and make her day problem free. And says David about the top of last week's show, very nuanced opening rant, Dan. I definitely believe I should be a good sibling to every other queer person supporting, protecting, and caring for them, including especially how I vote while recognizing not everyone is going to be a good queer sibling towards me. All right. I guess I wasn't a good gay sibling to that caller's dad. And after reading everyone's comments, more than a hundred now, most of them about that one call and response, I was too harsh and I failed to make allowances for different people's different experiences. That said, two quick things I want to push back against. A lot of people in the comments were doing the math, figuring out it was the late eighties or early nineties when the caller's dad married the caller's mom. People often talk about the nineties, like it was impossible to be out then. Things are better now because people came out and worked hard to make them better. Remember when Rosie O'Donnell and Ella DeGeneres came out in the 90s and started to work hard to make it better? It wasn't impossible to be out then, though, if you knew yourself to be gay, which, again, the caller's father may or may not have realized prior to marrying the caller's mom. Also, some commenters suggested that it was somehow easy for me to come out as a teenager in Chicago and then didn't do the math. I was a teenager in Chicago. I was 15 years old in 1979 with a homophobic cop for a dad and a loving but very Catholic woman for a mom and no role models, no one in my family who was gay, no gay friends, no gays on TV, no gays to talk to or get support from on the internet. And since we all come out in stages, I was still coming out after Reagan was elected in 1980 and the AIDS crisis hit in 82, coming out. Back when I did as a teenager was a lot of things, but it was not easy. It was no breeze. All right. For more listener comments and more of my responses, check out Struggle Session, a weekly bonus column for Magnum Subs. Goes up every Thursday at savage.love. It is where you will find my Muppet-faced man of the week. And now, listener response calls. Hi, Dan. This is a response call to the woman at the top of the last episode who called in because her boyfriend is uncomfortable around periods. Um, Dan, I appreciate your being an ally uh, as a woman myself. It is so ridiculous that men can't think about or talk about periods without 
being weird and freaking out. Having said that, I think you may have been a skosh too eager in your allyship and missed how obnoxious this caller is being. Caller, you said you've been dating this guy for a couple of months and you're angry with him and considering dumping him because of how one of his admittedly ridiculous opinions could hypothetically impact your hypothetical children? That is bonkers. That is so obnoxious. You are not you're not with this person in a way that you're you're not having children right now. You are cohabitating. You uh, there's no ring. You you're not pregnant. What like what are you talking about? Your beef is with society on this one, which programs us all to be kind of uncomfortable with the idea of periods. Um, Take note the next time you see a pad or tampon commercial, which is being specifically marketed to women on their periods, they use blue liquid to show absorbency because red would be too icky and like blood. So your beef is with society. This is a response call to the woman whose boyfriend's thoughts all about periods are stuck in middle school. Here's an easy litmus test. Find a clip of one of those awful podcast bros, like an Andrew Tate or whatever, uh, where they discuss periods with the same level of disrespect and mirror back to him how fucking ridiculous he sounds. If he isn't moved, sadly, he's not the one. If feasible, freeze your eggs for a little peace of mind and continue your search for a partner. Hi, Dan. This is in response to the hot tub caller. We bought a hot tub, and it was just a hot tub, and we had our mutual friends over for platonic hot tub fun, and then we became swingers. So watch out. And we're going to leave it there. We've got three ways for you to get us your questions or your comments for a future show. You can record your question or comment at savage.love slash askdan. Or you can make a voice memo on your phone and email us your question to q at savage.love. Or you can call us on our landline and leave us a message at 206-302-2064. Hump is coming to Long Beach, California for a one-night only screening this week. Go to humpfilmfest.com if you're in or near Long Beach and want to see the show. Then Hump 2024 Part 1 heads to theaters all over the U.S., Canada, and Europe. Come see the funniest, dirtiest, kinkiest, sexiest Hump Film Fest ever. Go to humpfilmfest.com to grab tickets. And yes, there will be streaming options available soon, but seeing Hump in a theater, watching porn, sitting next to strangers in the dark like your grandparents used to, it is the best way to experience Hump. And if you're coming to Hump in Berlin on April 9th or 10th, I will see you there. Also, this Thursday, I will see you at Savage Love Live. All my Magnum subs, please join me for Savage Love Live this Thursday. Watch for the invites in your email on Thursday morning. Follow me on Instagram and threads at Dan Savage. Follow me at Blue Sky at Dan Savage. And follow me still at The Bad Place at Fake Dan Savage. Follow Rob Wild if you dare on Twitter at It's Rob Wild with an E. And you can also find him on OnlyFans at It's Rob Wild. The Savage Lovecast, produced every week by Nancy Hartunian and me and the tech savvy at Rescue and Nancy. We will all be back at you next week with an installment of the Savage Lovecast. Thank you for telling me.